And now, the survival show that once survived an in-depth discussion about beaver safety. In this episode, Justin Carroll drops back by. For those who don't know, he's a former Marine Recon, Marine Special Operations, and Alphabet Soup kind of guy who ran in 1911 for a living. So today, he's going to share with us some basics about the reality of depending on one and the must-have options for neophytes. Howdy and welcome to the Rabbit Hole's Urban Survival Podcast. This is episode number 228. I'm your host, Aaron, and you are in the Rabbit Hole. Safe and sound. Justin, welcome back to the rabbit hole, dude. Aaron, thanks for having me on, man. Now, this is fun because you're actually here in person. You are live and in the studio. We've hung out and drank beer and ate pizza and played with your puppy dog, Pepper, and having all kinds of fun. Yeah. Yeah, it has been a good time, man. Cool. So today we decided we, we were going to do something else, and then we realized it was going to be difficult. Like the two other things we were going to talk about were going to be difficult to do in an audio format. And we started talking about 1911s and finally we were like, well, first you were like, damn you, because now I want a 1911. And I'm like, <laughs> damn myself, because I want a 1911 now. Um, but we decided we were going to have a, a, a casual conversation about 1911s, which I know very little about 1911s. When I, early on in my, at, at the er, onset of my gun lust, I went out and at that time, the hot new sexy was the 40 Smith & Wesson, which is now just referred to as the 40 and that was what all the gun magazines and at the time i was like 21 years old and so of course my level of expertise was well i went to all the the gun magazines yeah, yeah i basically went to the convenience store and just bought every gun magazine they had and read up on and everybody was talking up the 40 so i went 40 for a while and then i went 357 sig because i finally decided i didn't really like the 40 and i still love the 357 sig but I didn't, I found that it was an, it was a very expensive round to train with. It's a cool round. It's a neat round. It's a very, uh, I think in a lot of ways, it's a very purpose built round. Uh, it's great if you're DPS or you're in some other situation where you may need to take long range shots, or if you just like guns that are really freaking loud when they go off. And then I eventually settled on the nine millimeter, but I never ended up with a 1911, but I always thought oh, those are really cool. One day I want to, it's, for no other other reason that it was the gun that my grandfather carried in two wars. It was the gun that my dad had. It was, you know, it is a piece of Americana now. It is truly a piece of Americana. So for that reason, I've always won one. But as far as understanding them, that is not something that I know much about. So let's start there. Rule number one, if someone doesn't listen to the rest of this episode, what's the number one most important thing they the number one most important feature that is going to make or break a 1911. If it doesn't say operator or spec ops or tactical on the side of it, throw it away. It's, yeah, no, okay. it's right. no good. Yeah. Well, now you have totally validated some, some opinions of it. I wanted to put tactical operator operating tactically across the side. Cause I really just, you know, it needs to be just a total badass. Um, because it's 1911, of course. Yeah. You don't want to be questioning in the back of your mind. Is this gun actually, tactical or operator enough for me so you, you want that emblazoned right there on the side right? right 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 like almost like one inch letters if you can if you can fit it on there like the full height of the slide yeah. i'm thinking like really big even if it has to wrap over the top of the slide oh, a little bit oh, oh that's extra that's extra tactical right there uh kidding aside like that was one of the things we were joking about because i'm like one of the problems i ran into was <laughs> there, there was a few pretty cool guns that to me seemed a reasonable price for a 1911, but they all ended up saying tactical or operator or some sort of complete asinine bullshit on the side of them. And that I think is more, uh, range porn than anything. It's a, Ooh, look at me. So, but I think you're, there's a lot of people that can talk about 1911s, but I think as far as you go, you got paid professionally to live and breathe and run a 1911 on almost a daily basis for a very long time. Um, so let's start at the beginning. What are your thoughts on the 1911 as a general use gun, as opposed to some of the more modern designs? Yeah. So I'm, I'm definitely not the guy that says that firearms development should have stopped in 
1911 or 1912 or whenever the 1911A1 was uh, came out, and and we reached the pinnacle of firearms perfection at that point. I th- I still think they're totally viable options, but definitely some downsides, right? Like mm. they're, um, I, I think they're much more of an enthusiast gun than just something you can go to the gun store, slap $600 on the counter and walk out with a gun that you can pretty well rely on. Like a Sager, a Smith and Wesson or M and P or a Glock. You should probably rely. You should definitely test those guns for reliability before you start carrying them or relying on them for home defense. But what are the odds that gun is going to be bad? On the other hand, I bought 1911s. I've, I've, uh, so I carried them in the military for a number of years. That's the gun I learned to shoot and actually had months and months and months of really professional, really top end instruction and tens of thousands of rounds of experience on. So naturally, that's what I gravitated toward when I started carrying concealed guns uh, and, you know, purchasing handguns for uh, for home defense and, and personal use. So. Uh, I've owned a bunch of them, and I would not say that universally they are as reliable as a Glock or an M&P or pretty much any of the combat Tupperware you buy off the shelf today. So, love 1911s. I love the feel of one in my hand. I, I like. I'm so ingrained to that grip angle and my thumb on top of the safety and and all that good stuff. I think they're phenomenal guns, and if you want to buy a gun that you can really and this is going to sound a little a little corny, a little cheesy, but like develop a relationship with like each 1911 is kind of an individual. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I think you kind of have to be willing to invest the time into learning that gun and its weird little ticks and whatever else. Mm-hmm. So they're not like, we'll just use Glock because that's the thing I'm most familiar with. And a Glock is very much a, a manufacturing process. They pump them out. Yeah. And they're they're pretty for the most part a Glock is a Glock is a Glock. They're all pretty true to spec with with some minor tolerances for for variants. <clears throat> but a 1911 is not like that from what I understand. I mean a lot of them especially when you start getting into the Bedouins, you start talking about things being hand fitted and all this. What does that mean when they're when they're talking about, like you and I were just talking about the Larry Bickers gunsmithing course and stuff like that and what but I guess for people that aren't familiar what is hand fitting and and all that in a very general sense. Yeah, so unlike a Glock, you can't just pull the trigger mechanism out of a 1911, drop a new one in, and be good to go. There's, well, first of all, how many manufacturers are making 1911 parts? It's dozens, if not scores. So there's tons of different 1911 parts out there. Uh, not all of them are manufactured to the same specifications, the same tolerances and all that. And you have oversight, gunsmith fit parts that need to be like hand filed to actually make them fit inside the gun and fit perfectly uh, with the rest of that gun. And then you have some pretty complicated mechanisms in there that kind of have to interact pretty precisely with each other. If you want like the, the full benefit of things you can get from a 1911, which is a really crisp like single action trigger. If you want that really nice crisp trigger, that's not gritty and has a bunch of take up and whatever, like that, all that that part fitment has to be really kind of precise, and and there's, you know, the more tolerance you introduce into that, the looser that gets, and you start to lose some of those really phenomenal benefits of a single action only gun. Mm-hmm. I ran into that once with uh, with my Glock. I was replacing one of the parts to remove as much of the take up as I could, or not the take up. I'm sorry, the over travel, and. I remember what a massive pain in the butt it was because it was literally pull it out of the gun, file a little bit, put it back in the gun, try it. Oh, no, I just locked the gun up. I can't move the trigger. <laughs> All right, let me do this weird trick I've learned to be able to still remove the slide on a Glock with the trigger locked up and <clears throat> do that, file a little bit more, stick it in. Oh, no, locked up. And I mean, rinse and repeat. And I, I think it took me, it took me like two hours just to file down this one little stupid piece to just remove that over travel from the trigger. And I get 1911. It's like, that's the whole damn gun is like that. At least for the gunsmith, unless you're doing, unless you are like a home gunsmith and doing it yourself. Yeah. I think if you're buying a Kimber or a Springfield armory or something in that like kind of price range of guns, they probably have that manufacturing process down a little bit. You know, it's probably automated to a greater extent than something like a Wilson combat where probably a gunsmith is hand fitting each internal part to make sure, uh, especially the lower parts, the sear and, and that sort of stuff 
yeah, you probably have a more automated process where parts are a little bit more interchangeable gun to gun to gun, but you also lose that precision of everything working like in perfect unison with everything else. And yeah, man, imagine doing that for like the slide rails, uh, the slide to frame fit and, and everything else. And, and that's why you buy off the shelf 1911s that, you know, you hold it by the grip and shake it. And it sounds like you're rattling a can of spray paint because the slide and the frame to fit is not like super precise, but Again, too, the more the tighter that tolerance is, the more opportunity for a little bit of dirt to bind the gun up and cause cause this to go wrong. Okay, is that is that a pretty because you are somebody that ran yours in in dirt and all kinds of different conditions? Is is that something that happens often, and is it something that under those conditions you don't necessarily want to run a super tight, super accurate nineteen eleven? Or or am I kind of conflating things? No, I, I think you're right. And I think the, I think guns are built to kind of different standards. I think guns that are built to uh, built for, you know, combat or like daily care use will intentionally have like lower tolerances in something that's like a match grade target competition type gun. Mm. So the the 1911s that we used when I was in uh, uh, Marine Special Operations Command and, and Force Recon before that were built by the Marine Corps Precision Weapon Shop at Quantico. And they were like the official categorization was those was was combat accurized, I think. But there was a lot of hand fitting of parts. Those guns were all hand built by armorers up there, but they weren't like these insane tight slide to frame fit guns. They were they were tighter than probably something you buy off the shelf, but they weren't like this perfect lock work. They were a little looser and kind of purpose built for that. Mm-hmm. So is it really the uniqueness, the, 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 uh, I guess just so that it's easy for people to get their arms around. So is it really like the personality of the gun? We'll call it like all its nuances. And, and is that really where a 1911 is different than owning a Glock or anything like that? Cause like with a Glock, it's like, like, as we said earlier, a Glock is a Glock is a Glock is a Glock. You know, maybe you change out the sights, maybe you do some work on the trigger, maybe you drop an apex trigger or something like that. Maybe you do some sort of stippling or something in the grip to kind of customize it and make your own. Uh, or you go off the rails and you turn a perfectly good $500 gun into a $1,500 gun. I think we were joking about that last night. But with 1911s, is it more about like, this is my gun, this is a very personal, It's it's got its own personality, this is how we jive, I know it's kinks and weirdnesses and everything else is that is that really the attraction yeah i think when it comes to maintaining the gun uh, much more so than running it if the gun runs it runs Mm. (laughs) but in fairness i've seen probably as many 1911s that don't run that as do uh uh, because man like small things cause big problems in 1911s it seems like where like with a glock yeah you really don't have to worry about it you can run several thousand rounds without really tearing your Glock down and cleaning it and, and all that stuff. But yeah, those parts start to interact and they start to wear with each other. So if you try to drop a new part in that hasn't worn with everything uh, else, okay. that's where you tend to run into like have to start hand fitting and especially for replacement and like just maintaining the gun. And again, back to that differences between manufacturers, like let's say I have a 1911 with a, I want to put an ambidextrous safety on it. Like parts interchangeability isn't just as easy as like, oh, I'm going to throw an ambi safety on here. You kind of have to look at, you know, how your gun's laid out to begin with. And yeah, the, you you can custom customize a 1911 to the nth degree, like whatever you want. But it a lot of it is stuff that if you do it at home, I, I would have questions about the reliability of the gun and the, you know, just the general function of the gun. Mm, okay. Which okay. if... if if it's just a range toy, probably doesn't matter all that much and it's like play with it and see what happens, see what you can do with it. But if you're really relying on it, I would want a, yeah, I would want a gunsmith doing everything to that gun for mm. me. So as, as your first 1911, or if it's a 1911, you're going to carry every day and you're not necessarily a full-time gunsmith. The, the answer, cause actually that was going to be one of my questions is build your own or, or buy one off the shelf. Uh, buy one off the shelf. Okay. Uh, unless you're like a really experienced 1911 guy. And I'm like, to be fair, I'm not Larry Vickers or like some of these guys that are like super deep in the weeds on 1911 gunsmithing and all that. I absolutely would not trust myself to build a 1911. 
and rely on that gun. Mm. It, it would probably work some of the time, but <laughs> like, man. Yeah, I don't want to protect my life <laughs> some of the time. Yeah. Yeah. I, I've been to a lot of shooting courses, both as like the military paid for me to go to, to a lot of you know, fancy shooting courses. And after I got out for the first three or four years, I wanted to maintain that. So I would go to, you know, Tiger Swan and whoever. And like you would always see that guy on the range with the 1911 almost invariably that would be having some sort of issue throughout the course. But you never see that with a Glock or an MP or whatever. Like those guns just run, they eat whatever you throw in them. They, they just work. Sometimes you would see that 1911 that would just run like a champ. And that that's a good feeling. That's a good thing to see. But mm. I, the odds aren't in your favor, I guess. So with y'all, because you, I mean, y'all are professionally putting your lives on them. So was it something where they were receiving regular maintenance and regular, because y'all were, I mean, you're, you're trusting more than just your life on it. You're trusting like your whole team members. Let me, let me make it easy. What kept y'all's guns running so carefully, so well? When you get issued the gun, you also get issued a gun log book and you're supposed to log every round you fire through that gun. Like at the end of the day, you know, 500 rounds, this state, this operator. And in our armory, we had a 2112, which is a 2111 is like your basic armor coming out of armor school or whatever. Your 2112 is actually a Marine Corps gunsmith. Okay. It's like on regular intervals, those would go back to get checked out by the 2112. And in fairness, man, really rare that you're going to use that gun. Although now like there's more special activity stuff going on, which is low visibility where a pistol might be all you have. But to that point, <laughs> Marine Special Operations Command has gone to the Glock 19, mm. like the SEALs and, you know, Army Special Operations Command. I, th- I think that's the direction most people are moving. I think it was a great gun. It had a great run. And I, I just think it's probably a lighter lift to go with the Glock where parts are super easily interchangeable. Mm. You like don't have to source all the parts individually. You don't have to source frames and slides and barrels and in in my last platoon, we had uh, most of the frames were still original GI frames, or we had some Caspian frames floating around, and maybe a couple of other things. Um, but barrels from Wilson Combat, Cart, Nolan, maybe Ed Brown, I, like barrels hmm. from all different sources. And these guns are all individually built, man. Which, when you compare that to paying, I don't know, government rate of like, I don't know, we'll say arbitrarily three hundred and fifty bucks for a Glock off the shelf, and you know damn good and well it's gonna work like yeah logistically it just seems like an easier lift and nine millimeter like the muse had to cart around a bunch of 45 ammo just for this one platoon that's attached to the mu when everybody else is using nine millimeter so that creates its own logistical problem Mm. i think it probably just makes sense in a military context to go to the to the clock so but y'all's i i guess to put a fine point on y'all's running so well Y'all was going back to an actual gunsmith on a somewhat regular basis <laughs> yeah, and being yeah. cared for and inspected. And, I, and I'm sure somebody was getting a ton lashing if they weren't fully and completely cleaning and maintaining the weapon properly. So you were constantly getting a feedback. Whereas like me, I, I'm not going to send my gun to the gunsmith. Like I take myself to the doctor and get checkups, which is basically yeah. what y'all were doing. I'm going to take mine to the gunsmith when something goes wrong and I can't figure it out. Or if I want to make alterations to the gun. So that makes sense. I mean, I guess in that context, like how are y'all trusting your lives with these things, putting that many rounds to them, putting them through such harsh conditions, that makes sense. They were getting checkups regularly. You made an interesting comment earlier when we were talking about this, which was magazines. Like you made a really big deal out of magazines to the point where I joked, like you just throw <laughs> away the factory magazines. So take us there for a minute. How important are magazines? What are the right magazines and why? Okay. So yeah, magazines are super important, and I, I think a lot of malfunctions in handguns can be traced back to some problem with that magazine, feed lip, spring, whatever, like mm. some, some issue with the magazine. And I, magazines are kind of an expendable item for me. If a magazine doesn't work, and as you know, I don't own any magazine-fed handguns currently. I'm, right. I'm uh, still the revolver guy. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, you know, a carbine, a uh, semi-automatic handgun if a magazine stops working reliably i chuck it It, it's and especially in the military like that was a big thing for us if a magazine doesn't work destroy it so somebody doesn't see that magazine sitting on the top of the trash can and like oh free mag (laughs) uh (laughs) uh, you know we just give it a boot stop and and den it in really good where it's you know just unusable magazines are expendable and 1911s 
this is a big problem because again, you have 50 different manufacturers making 1911 magazines to vastly different standards. And we got issued when you checked out your, your gun, you got issued seven, I think it was seven or eight Wilson combat magazines. And I, I actually personally upgraded those to the Wilson combat eight round magazines, which are, you know, still the same length overall, but they take an additional round, which always a good thing, Mm -hmm. Not, not a bad thing to have. So man, I've, I've seen people run like the chip McCormick extended mag in their gun. It's like a 10 round mag that sticks out the bottom of the bottom of the gun. And those worked mostly still saw less problems with the Wilson combat mags. Like unequivocally, I will say that is the best 1911 magazine out there, mm. at least in a 45. And I'm sure they're nine millimeter. And I don't know if they make 40 Smith and Wesson uh, versions. 10, they do. I think they do make 10 millimeters. But as far as a 45 1911 magazine goes, Wilson combat, as far as I'm concerned, is the absolute last word. Plus, they have that nice bumper on the bottom. Mm. So if you buy a factory 1911 from probably Kimber, Springfield, Smith & Wesson, SIG, whoever's making 1911s now, it's going to be a flush fit magazine on the bottom, which doesn't really give you anything to drive that magazine home when you're doing a reload. Oh, yeah. So even if I were, I did trust that SIG 1911 magazine, which in fairness, they probably have a vendor for that part. Mm. Prob- I don't know. Maybe they make it in-house, but I'd be kind of surprised. Yeah, I think in general, to, to take a side, John, I think it's amazing how a lot of manufacturers don't manufacture all their own parts or even a lot of their own parts, yeah. and they'll actually outsource it to somebody like like LMT makes a lot of parts for a lot of the other really high-end AR companies and things like that. So that's in- interesting. So yeah, they could be outsourcing yeah, it too. Yeah. Well, you know, it's still a Wilson. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, even if I did buy that magazine or trust that magazine, say I've shot this magazine a bunch, I, I, I trust it, I believe in it, I'd still buy some sort of bumper to put on the bottom of it just to give you something to slap. Interesting, when you're, okay. So uh, otherwise your hand is just going to come up flush with the bottom of the frame and you don't have a really good, uh, you know, the, the magazine doesn't stick out any further than that. So, mm. so it's almost like not a good purchase. Almost. Yeah, unless yeah, you're just nailing it, you're not yeah. going to seat that magazine fully. So yeah, Wilson Combat, only way to go in my book. We'll be back after this quick break. Things are pretty quiet in the gun community right now. You know, there's no crazy laws coming out or big new calls for gun control. And gun owners like myself are feeling pretty safe and pretty good about things right now. Pretty optimistic. But you never know when the next gun-grabbing bonanza is going to start driving prices sky high and inventories crazy low because every Tom, Dick, and Harry decides that's the moment they need a gun, right? Now, we're really big on skills over gear around here. But sometimes, pieces of gear just can't be beaten. And that's where a gun fits into your preparedness plans. This usually brings up where to get the best deal with the least BS, because gun buying can be just a headache. You should try martinarmory.com. They were founded with a simple goal, to make buying a gun simple and affordable. And instead of carrying thousands of different guns, they only carry 25. This is kind of crazy, but it allows them to focus on providing the most popular guns on the market at the very lowest prices. Now, for a limited time, ITRH listeners get a little something, something extra. You get free shipping. Simply go to martinarmory.com, pick out a gun, and enter the promo code RABBITHOLE at checkout. Again, that's martinarmory.com. Dot com. Enter the promo code rabbit hole at checkout. Listener, do you get at least $3 a month worth of value out of ITRH? You should see what we do for the Roving Horde Armada members. Check it out today by visiting ITRH.net. Members get access to episodes a day early, access to monthly virtual and in person meetups in some areas. An invitation to the secret ITRH Armada Facebook group so you can chat about survival all day long with like-minded people. Access to every episode ever produced by ITRH. That's right, all the way back to the beginning, including one that was never aired. And those are just a few things you get with your membership when you sign up and become part of the ITRH Roving Horde by going to ITRH.net. Again, that's ITRH.net. So what are some other important features? Because I know, okay, so let's go with sights. We we were talking about that too. 
And I guess this becomes as much of a general gun, a handgun conversation when you yeah. talk about sites as, as, as much as 1911. But we'll just go here for a minute. Where, where do you land with sites in general? Because you had some interesting thoughts with that. Yeah, I, I'm totally a night sight guy. I've shot fiber optics. I'm, they're cool. But I, I, I don't know, man. They, fiber optics just don't do it for me. For whatever reason, I don't like that big, bright, glaring ball of green light up there, whatever it is. Like, mm. it just doesn't do it for me. I, I'm, on the other hand, a firm believer in night sights. I hate the three dot arrangement. I don't know, like the two dots on the rear and the one dot on the front. I don't know why that has become the standard. I don't know if you're familiar with the Heine straight mm-hmm. eights, but you have, or the uh, Warren Tacticals, the last Glock I had had Warren Tactical sights on my, on the gun. And you have one dot on the front sight. That Warren Tactical arrangement I had was a bright green dot on the front. And on the back, you have a subdued orange dot. So you just line the two dots up vertically instead of the three side to side to side. Okay. Uh, so I think there's like less room for error there. And, and when I'm shooting targets on the range, when I'm, you know, being a paper slayer, I'm not really looking at those dots anyway. So I don't really like that arrangement is less important to me. I'm not lining the three dots up. I'm lining the blades up equal height, equal light, all that good stuff. Right. Mm. Kind of more focus on the front sight than the rear. I, I, I don't know why three dots are the standard. And even more baffling to me is why manufacturers insist on putting like three white non fiber optic or non night sight dots. It, it, if, if you're going to do that, just give me like solid black fronts and rears like, i've actually heard of a few people i know that are more experienced uh when i say more i'm saying more than the general gun community experienced gun gun guys that will run all blacked out sites that's their thing and to me that's it's interesting because I, I guess i've never tried it so i don't know and i guess that really is a reaction thing and you're just equal height equal light yeah the the last the last 1911 i owned which was kind of recently, a couple of years ago, I owned a, a Kimber Pro Carry, and you're going to get hate mail because Kimber is like such a hot button manufacturer. Mm. But uh, it was a Kimber Pro Carry with just strictly, it was like a Novak profile site, just a black front, a black rear. I think both the front and rear, uh, not checkered, but had the serrations. It's just a black on black arrangement. And, and really, that's what I'm looking at when I use sites anyway. The dots are just there for like conditions of low light. Mm. So I don't, I, I don't get the like fascination with, you know, if you buy a Smith and Wesson MMP, it has like little three little plastic dots on the sites that fall off after about a hundred rounds anyway. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, that's like the joke about the Glock sites. The only, they're just placeholders the for real sites. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. They're, uh, <laughs> that's funny. I hadn't heard that expression. That's funny. So I think another thing you pointed out was like ledges. And that was, that was something I've heard. And we even talked about, uh, that that it is a a narrow band use case but it's like well you carry a gun for for narrow band situations to begin with like statistically very low things that you're going to get in but and then when you start talking about the ledge what you were talking about y'all had to train we can't strong hand drawing clearing malfunctions and everything walk us through that just like a little bit and then we can talk about why that how then ledges become important yeah so we had a like part of our qualification and so during the cqb package we would I have like three weeks of just flat range work before we went into the house and you had to pass this pretty demanding qualification. And the focus of most of the qual was shooting on the move, shooting while moving. And you absolutely had to pass that qual to go hot in the house. Like they're not going to put someone in the house that can't hit paper on the flat range. So when you say putting somebody in the house, what does that mean? Uh, so live fire in the CQB house, which we had, okay. we had a couple different, uh, we had a single story and a three story you know, 360 degree live fire houses. And, you know, like only a portion of the CQB package was live fire in the house on bullet traps or whatever. And then a lot of it moved into like simunition against live aggressors and, and mm, stuff okay. like that. But you had to pass that call. And then once you were actually in the house, you, we still had to go back out to the live range. I think it was every week and requal to maintain that qualification so you could actually do the housework. So, a portion of that qual, there were a couple different stages where you had to do a strong hand only, strong hand draw. So one handed, draw the weapon, present it, and fire like a prescribed number of shots in a time limit. All our qualification stages were on time. You also had to do a weak hand only, weak hand draw. So you had to get to the gun with your weak hand, put it between your legs, get a good firing grip, and come back out. So 
all of these are on time. And if you had a malfunction, you had to clear it with your weak hand only or with your strong hand only, depending on what the drill was. There was, you know, I see a lot of, um, and, and for good reason, but I see a lot of uh, weak hand only shooting now. It's like, okay, administratively pull the gun out of your holster pl- with your strong hand, place it in your weak hand. Uh, but that wasn't the way it worked for us. Like everything had to be done. weak hand only you draw the gun, put it between your legs, acquire grip, present out fire. If you had a malfunction, you had to clear it with your weak hand only. We're, you know, we're simulating the fact that your strong hand has been disabled for some reason. If you didn't perform that correctly with your strong hand only or weak hand only, you didn't get to reshoot that that stage. Mm. So you would go over time, you'd lose those points, and then that would be taken off off of your cumulative score. So we, yeah, we did that quite a bit, and I still I still do that with all my firearms that I actually shoot. I still do some strong hand only, weak hand only stuff. So having that ledge lets you gives you a good surface to rack the slide off of. And like we were saying, likely, probably not. I will say that I read a pretty good ar- article recently, and I'll make sure you have it for the show notes, but based on some statistical analysis, malfunctions are maybe a little more likely in a gunfight because your grip is really rushed getting it out and probably mm. not the most solid grip. And you know some other things are going on that, that can maybe make malfunctions a little more likely. So I want a way to clear those or a way to reload the gun weak hand only or strong hand only. So I like having, I like having the ledge. It looks great on a, you know, on a sales slick when they're marketing the gun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Is it something that's absolutely critical? No, I've, I've carried guns without them, but I, I do like having it there. You know, I've just realized we probably actually even haven't even, haven't even explained what the ledge is that we're talking about. <laughs> so there's oh, probably crap. somebody other just like, what ledge or what, what, what ledge am I jumping off of here? Yeah, you're absolutely right. So the rear sight, instead of sloping down gradually to meet the slide, as we go forward on the gun, like toward mm-hmm. the ejection port, we'll, we'll have a nice sharp ledge. So it sticks up like just a, a big block and it gives you a nice solid surface. So if I have to rack the handgun off of my belt, like that flat surface will actually catch on my belt. I can push the grip forward and it will, the slide will stay put. So it'll let me lock the slide to the rear or just maybe all I need to do is a tap rack reassess, you know, tap the magazine on my thigh, rack the slide off my belt and, and try it again. Does, hmm. that, does that make sense? Does that explain it well enough? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Cause it's basically like a 90 degree turn that actually gives you a, a solid flat surface using the front of the site to catch on things and then be able to manipulate the slide back and forth. Yeah. Cause it is like, yeah, you're not going to manipulate it with those. I've had sites that I've tried it on my SIGs and that, that were, did not have a ledge and they had that, that kind of gentle, pretty scoop taken out of them and it just slides right off everything. Yeah. So that makes sense. Which if that is the case, you can actually, the sites we ran were like the Novak, like nice, smooth slope sites. Mm-hmm. So if like we had taken a knee and needed to do that, you can use the front sight like off your boot or something, mm, okay. put the front sight against your boot, press the, the grip forward and then hit the, the slide lock. Mm. Okay. So you had brought up grip checkering as being a big deal. Yeah. The front strap and a lot of 1911s you buy will still have a very smooth front strap. That's the thing that is non-negotiable for me. The front strap has to be checkered or something on the front strap. If you're already into a 1911 that doesn't have that and you don't want to send it off to have it checkered it, you can buy skateboard tape. And actually, there's probably a manufacturer that uh, VZ Grips, I think, sells tape that is cut specifically for that standard 1911 front strap. Huh, okay. It's not the best solution. And I'll be honest, my 1911 I carried at, at work did not have a checkered front strap, and that's what I used. But I always cut that so it fit under the grips a little bit so the grips would screw down tight Oh, okay. Over it to keep it from sliding around or sliding off or whatever. Mm. But that's a pretty workable solution with the caveat that you probably need to keep an eye on it and change it out occasionally because that that glue will eventually give up and you'll find yourself getting a really tight grip and feeling that skateboard tape like just slide around just a little bit. Yeah. And I I don't like that. <laughs> <laughs> I would imagine not. That's interesting. I wonder why y'all's warrant didn't have some sort of grip or texturing or something on the front. Who knows, man? Some yeah. sort of some sort of military specification that box didn't get checked for whatever reason. And uh, a lot of those frames were really, really old. But like our armor was able to look up the dates, and some of those are manufactured in the 1940s, and right. we're still in service. And some of those frames get cracked and get you know demilled and 
I, I wonder, and this is where it's evident that I'm not a 1911 expert. I wonder if maybe frames that are meant to be checkered are made a little thicker around the front strap. So there's actually room to checker that. And those were just like actual GI frames that were very thin and couldn't be checkered. Maybe mm-hmm. I don't know. Interesting. So what does that, what does that checkering do in that surface? I guess, is it just allowing you to keep a better grip? that much more friction on yeah, the weapon you'll notice if you pick up a 1911 that's not checked like that kimber i was talking about that pro mm. carry and that that wasn't a carry gun it was a total impulse it's very slick the the front of the gun like you pick up a glock your glock has like you know checkering and finger grooves and all that stuff along the front strap mm. imagine if that thing were just perfectly smooth and slick yeah and like r- nicely rounded off it's a very slick surface that that's kind of been a critical part of your grip as far as like checkering, like the mainspring on the back, the mainspring housing, nice to have, probably not absolutely necessary relative to that front strap grip. That's a significant percentage of what you're actually holding onto the gun with. So, mm, okay. You brought up uh, bushingless barrels versus bushing barrels and start to talk us through that a little bit. Okay. So, the bushingless barrel, those will typically have a very like thick, profile barrel a bull barrel and the man the the bushing is hard to explain it's basically this little bushing that goes like slips over the barrel and then like locks into place Mm. and then you don't have a full length guide rod with that you have a spring that's kind of loose with basically this little end cap that goes on the spring that like presses down you rotate the bushing around and then it locks into place and holds the bushing okay um if that's clear as mud for you clear as mud yeah (laughs) uh so typically the bushingless barrels will have a full length guide rod which some people prefer i think if if the price point is exactly the same on those two guns it it probably doesn't matter all this all that much i'm not like again i'm not the guy that like john moses browning was you know the god of all things handguns and (laughs) Uh and you can't deviate from his master plan (laughs) but I don't think the the bushingless barrel or the bull barrel really does anything. So I certainly wouldn't pay more for it if that's a, if you're looking at a 1911 and thinking, hmm, this one of the bushingless barrels, a hundred dollars more. I I wouldn't pay a hundred. Also, it makes the gun a little harder to take apart. The a 1911 is actually pretty easy to take down without the bushingless barrel. When you get the bushingless barrel, though, then you start to need like maybe special tools to take it down. You have oh, to interesting. Okay, I didn't know to, that. Uh, pull the spring back to a certain point and put a paper clip in it to lock this, you know, to, to collapse that guide rod a little bit. They vary, uh, which is another thing I don't like. I like the standardization of the 1911. If they all have like standard non full length guide rods and, and regular bushing barrels, you know how to take it apart. When you get into the more specialized stuff, they start to vary a little bit, uh, which means you have to learn exactly how to take your gun apart. Hmm. Okay. Is there, is there any advantage then other than it seems like it's one less part to futz with of, of, of a bushingless barrel? I think it's, uh, I think it's more of a, again, a thing that looks awesome on a marketing slick mm. rather than an actual conveyed benefit. Cause even if you look at a lot of the really high end 1911s, Ed Brown, Wilson combat Nighthawk custom, which as I'm trying not to say the word Nighthawk custom because because <laughs> we're uh, both going to end up blowing a paycheck. <laughs> <laughs> if you look at those, they're still standard bushing barrels. And mm. like those guys know what they're doing. There, there's no need to reinvent the wheel. But by the same token, like the bushingless barrel guns, they do work as much as any 1911 does work, I guess. Mm. So if you have one with a bushingless barrel, don't run out and sell it because well, definitely not because I said <laughs> the the standard barrel guide rod arrangement is the way to go. Uh, is is there anything else to consider with when it comes to the guide rods? No, not really. So another thing we got issued, and this is kind of a random sidetrack. We also got issued these Wilson Combat shock buffs. Okay, and I don't know if you've ever seen these, uh-uh. but it's basically just it's a blue plastic little buffer pad. And the guide rod on a standard 1911 is only about, I don't know, two, maybe three inches long. The spring fits over that and you have to kind of manipulate this arrangement into the gun because there's not a single guide rod that, you know, captures. It's not a captive spring. So that spring is its own part. 
basically you take the spring off and you slide this little shock buff over the guide rod. So it's supposed to cushion the back of the guide rod from the spring or whatever. Okay. So we were actually issued packages of those with our 1911s and supposed to change them out every I don't know, 250 rounds, 500 rounds, something like that. Mm. And I don't find that they really make any difference one way or the other as far as like long-term legit longevity of the gun, reliability of the gun or anything. I think it's just one more thing in there that could potentially fall apart if you're not taking your gun apart regularly and changing it out. And I think it's just needless complexity in the system, but that's just a random, a random Justin Carroll opinion. about. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So what about, uh, we talked about light rails too, because I personally was like on a 1911, since I'm not, if I get a 1911, it's going to be a range princess. It's not something I necessarily take to courses or anything like that, unless I have random extra time and random extra money and want to go take a dedicated 1911 course. So for me, I didn't see the point of a, a the light rail. I like the the cleaner, smoother aesthetic lines of the original 1911, but where do you, where do you wind up with that? So our, our guns at the time did not have light rails because they're on these old frames. When the Marine Corps moved to the M45 CQB pistol, which uh, they contracted Colt to build mm. like literally days before they went to the Glock, those did come with light rails, which I really would have appreciated in a gun that I'm actively going into a hostile environment with. I, I'm a big fan of white light. And later when I was carrying Glocks in places like that, I had a white light on my carbine, a white light on my pistol, and a handheld white light. I, I mean, you can never have too many flashlights. <laughs> uh-huh. um, if you're going to use the gun for home defense, probably not the worst idea to have a light rail, but there's some, I don't know that I would do it for a concealed carry pistol because I'm probably not, that adds a lot of bulk to the gun. Yeah, unless you're trying to add bulk to your to to the front of your trousers and you're going yeah. to appendix carry uh, and, and you just want to show off to the ladies, I, I, I wouldn't <laughs> see... Uh, shoving that big that big light down my pants is as being fun well and you have to if you plan to use the gun for home defense and hang a light on it and then carry it without the light now you have to get into holsters that are made for guns with a light rail so you cut your holster options down pretty considerably i don't think they impact the reliability of the gun at all in fact if you're shooting 45 i think probably a little more bulk on the end of the gun is probably not the worst thing in the world to have hmm. but yeah it, like kind of personal preference and kind of a general kind of a general pistol thing in some contexts but with the holster thing like you don't have to worry about getting a glock holster with a light rail or without a glock a light rail because they all have that little yeah they all have that kind of like 1911 rail across the the bottom of it anyway so yeah yeah forward cocking serrations you and i were going back and forth about this a little bit talk to us a little bit about forward cocking serrations oh man i don't know why but i will always favor a gun that has them versus one that does not Mm. um i i feel like i have a little bit more control of the slide out toward the front end especially on a full size like a five inch 1911 than i do at the back end and uh man maybe this is just my tactical (laughs) self kicking in Uh, You know, when I run an AR, it's pretty much just a slick gun. I don't need a lot of tactical accessories or or whatever. But for whatever reason, on a handgun, I really appreciate forward cocking serrations. There's, it seems like maybe a little bit less chance if I'm, if I'm cocking the, you know, clearing a malfunction, I want to go toward the front of the slide because I feel like there's less chance maybe of getting my hand over the ejection port and, you know, getting in the fouling, the clearing of that gun or, or whatever the case may be, man. But I, I do really like a nice firm purchase pretty much wherever I decide to grab that gun. I don't, I don't like being boxed into, you have to grab it by the back of the slide where, you know, there's other stuff back there. There's a safety back there Mm, and all that good stuff. But I think you just sold me on, on, on serrations. (laughs) (laughs) Go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, I, I mean, that's pretty much it. There, if you handed me an otherwise perfectly functional and, you know, working 1911 that didn't have front cocking serrations, I wouldn't discount it as a working fighting pistol, but I, I do like having those if I have the choice, I guess. Mm-hmm. That's a, it's a, okay. So I think for me, what, what just kind of sealed it was the idea that it, it's more options. 
it's one more place on the gun that you can grab and and move forward. Although I still, it still worries me. I still think oh, I'm going to burn the shit out of my fingers. <laughs> I hate, I hate getting burned. Um, not that I know anybody who really like, that's not true. I knew this one girl. No, I don't know. So as far as like, there was one that I was looking at and it had like the, the Wilson combat Magwell, I guess it was an extension or a flare. What is that? It was like an extra piece you can put down on the Magwell. I know Glock just entered, or no, it wasn't Glock. It was Magpul just introduced something that was a Magwell expander thing you could put on a Glock, but we're staying with 1911s or at least trying to. So what is it with that? So it just gives you a bigger funnel to get that magazine in. So the standard 1911 frame just has a hole that is perfectly sized to fit a 1911 magazine. So you got to be pretty precise with that reload. And I did put one of those. We had a pretty good policy about if you want to modify your care, your, your military issued gun somehow, like just run it through somebody make sure it's not something crazy. So I did put one of those Wilson combat, um, Magwell, like flared Magwell extensions on there. Mm -hmm. It just gives you a big funnel to get you to that 1911 magazine size hole instead of having to nail that perfectly. If you're a little bit off, the magazine basically just gets guided to where it needs to go. Mm -hmm. For a carry gun, that adds a little more length to the overall grip of the gun. So that's a consideration. And a lot of your really high end 1911s will kind of have that built into like the the frame itself will be filed down to be as wide as it can be. And then sometimes the, the you know, maybe on a custom frame, a frame will be just a little bit longer and flared out a little bit more. And maybe that'll be integrated with the grips and all that good stuff. So it's just not an additional part hanging on the gun. It's just inherent in the design. Okay. Let's talk about holes. Uh, so skeletonized hammers and triggers. Is there anything beyond aesthetics? Does it go faster? Does it, what does that do? The skeletonized hammer, I, I think is a great idea. I think the shape of it is, is better. I, I'm a big fan of having a beaver tail on the gun. Mm. Maybe we'll get to later, but you know, if you look at the old school picture from world war two of GIs shooting the 1911, the, the back of the gun, it's if you get your hand really high up on the gun where you should have it, you know, your, your radius as in line with the bore as you can possibly make it and a high firm grip There's, that hammer is coming back, like biting the, the meaty portion of your, the back of your hand. Mm. Uh, so like the shape of that, like cut down hammer is good. As far as like ultralight, there's all sorts of like super high speed ultralight hammers and titanium firing pins to like speed the lock work and all this stuff. Unless you're running the gun to the absolute top of its capability and you're trying to squeeze a little bit more out of it, that's money spent on something that you could probably spend on ammo or range time or a training course with someone or mm. or something. I, I don't think those things are practical or, you know, even me with hundreds, thousands, maybe hours on the range under like professional instructors. That is probably not something I'm going to see the actual benefit out of. Okay. And like as far as holes in the trigger and all that, I think that's just to make it look neat, mm. maybe more than anything else. And and the skeletonized hammer, even if it was a solid piece, like I I do like that shape of the skeletonized hammer just because of how it works with extended uh, uh, other extended controls. Okay. Okay. And uh, you brought up beavers. So let's talk <laughs> about beavers. Always happy to talk about beavers. Right. Yeah. I. If you're looking for a 1911 that is going to be anything other than this is exactly what my granddad carried in World War II, mm. you probably want that extended beaver tail. So that gives you a couple of benefits. So the 1911 has a grip safety, which you're, you know, something, your hand has to be wrapped around that grip, depressing that safety on the back of the frame. And that beaver tail is going to come up a little higher and come out a little further. It lets you get your hand a little higher on the gun. And then that skeletonized hammer, there's a big groove milled out of that beaver tail that that skeletonized hammer kind of fits in. Absolutely 100%. That's a non-negotiable part for me mm -hmm. is, a, is a beaver tail a safety, a beaver tail grip safety. And I'd also look for a safety with a memory bump on it, which is at the bottom of that grip safety. It just has an additional little bump out that makes your, that makes depressing that grip safety a little more sure. Oh, interesting. Okay. So, there, so there's less chance of like wrapping your hand around the grip of the gun in maybe like less than an ideal presentation from the holster. 
and not fully depressing that. And if that's not fully depressed, the gun's not going to fire. So, mm. uh, which also is kind of a thing. Like I've been, I carry appendix. That's kind of another thing in favor of the 1911, that grip safety. Even if everything's gone wrong, your safety is deactivated and something falls into that holster that's going to interact with the trigger. As long as you're not depressing that grip safety, you still have a pretty good margin for error there, I guess. Uh And I'm not saying to be cavalier about reholstering in the appendix position, Mm. but that gives me a little more, just, just one more level of comfort. If I were going to carry a 1911, uh, daily, which I'm not currently, but if you keep showing me sexy 1911 pictures, (laughs) (laughs) yeah, yeah. I guess uh, for context, we were, we were playing around on the Nighthawk, uh, website, uh, before before recording and and I think we were both working ourselves into a lather going do I really need a thirty five hundred dollar nineteen eleven no I probably don't but I would, would like one and I think that's probably actually to take the beaver like is that I I know it's an integral part and I do know that there are some manufacturers that have done away with the not the beaver tail itself but the actual safety that extra safety but for you that's something you're like no 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 I really want that. Yeah, I kind of like that. And that's a thing that if you like, same with the 1911, the thumb safety with an extended thumb safety and with that beaver tail safety, it's my opinion that if you're gripping the gun correctly, both of those safeties are going to be deactivated kind of on their own. You don't have to think about it a whole lot. So when I come out of the holster with the 1911, my thumb automatically goes to the top of the thumb safety. If my grip is correct and I have that memory bump, I'm deactivating that grip safety. So it's just the decision of press the safety down. And that's the whole time I'm shooting that 1911, that strong hand thumb will be riding on top of that safety, making sure it doesn't get bumped back up. And just, it's it's a good index point for knowing my grip is where it should be. It should, that, that thumb should be right along the top of that extended thumb safety. Okay. All right. Well, I think that's a good place to leave off and we can go back to looking at sexy, sexy pictures of Nighthawk, <laughs> Nighthawk custom <laughs> limbs. Dude, it has been lots of fun hanging out with you and finally getting to uh, meet you in person and uh, getting to play with your puppy dog and stuff. And uh, dude, I really appreciate you dropping in. Yeah. Thanks for having me, man. For more delicious gun goodness, check out Justin's revolver blog by going to revolverguy.com. Links to Justin and other resources from this episode can be found by going to in the rabbit hole.com slash E228. Support the show and get great members only benefits at the same time by becoming part of the Roving Horde Armada. Go to itrh.net. Again, that's itrh.net for more information. With that, we wrap up episode number 228 from the Lone Star State. Till next time, stay safe and sound. sound.